Amen. How many come looking in expectation? Yes, sir. You come in expectation. I'm going to ask that you stand. I need you to repeat after me. We, the Grace New Covenant Apostolic Church, a body of believers, enforce God's original plan and purpose in our lives and in the life of our ministry. We are citizens of the kingdom of God. And we have what we say. We are doers of the word of God. And not just hearers only. We are what the word of God says. We have what the word of God said we can have. And we can do what the word of God says we can do. We hold fast to our confession of faith. We do not turn coward, faint, lose heart, or give up. We decree and declare increase, multiplication, and blessings today in Jesus' name. I am Grace New Covenant. Hallelujah. In the book of 2 Chronicles, chapter number 14, I'm going to ask that you remain standing. 2 Chronicles, chapter 14, beginning with verse number 11. 2 Chronicles 14, verse 11. Now that's right after 1 Chronicles. just thought I'd give you some... And Asa cried unto the Lord his God and said, Lord, it is nothing with thee to help. Oh, hallelujah. Whether with many or with them that have no power, help us, O oh Lord our God, for we rest on thee. And in thy name we go against this multitude. O oh Lord, thou art our God, let no man prevail against thee. Amen. You may be seated. We read earlier in the book of Leviticus concerning the offerings. And that's kind of where I want to start with the offerings. And the laws of the sacrifice take up several chapters of the Old Testament. And because we no longer operate under the sacrificial system, it sometimes makes for tedious reading for those of us who are accustomed to buying neatly packaged meat from the local grocery store. It is difficult to comprehend and sometimes hard to stomach reading about the requirements of the sacrifice. The Bible was very specific in describing the things that were to be placed on the fire. We know that the animal being sacrificed was first bled to death. The throat was cut. And the blood was caught in a basin, then sprinkled upon the altar with the remainder of the blood poured at the base of the altar. Next, the animal had to be butchered and all of the fat removed. And it was this fat that was placed on the fire to be burned as our text described. In fact, the next verse following our text in Leviticus 3 and 17 says, And it shall be a perpetual statue 
for your generation throughout all your dwellings that ye neither that you neither eat fat nor blood so for all of you that like fat meat <laughs> you you you're not supposed to be eating it and for those that like your steak, when you cut it, it bleed. You, you're really not supposed to be eating. And I'm not telling you to change. I'm just saying what the word says here. Did you ever notice what happens when fat is placed on fire? Meat will cook and eventually turn, turn will burn up, leaving a rough uh, gristle uh, charcoal, it just kind of burns and get hard, the meat will. And you probably uh, seen that some of the cooks, uh, you've seen some of this in your cookouts when, when, when the fat begin to burn, the fire, you have to really watch it. Because it fuels the fire, causing fire to flare up. And it will also smoke. And when you are grilling fatty meat, the fat will drip into the fire causing smoke. And many grill masters declare that's where you get the flavor of the flavor of the meat is from the fat that melted into the fire and caused the fire to come up. What does that have to do with the laws of sacrifice? Well, in the Jewish Bible provides an interesting translation of the last verse of our text. The priest shall make them smoke upon the altar. It is the food of the offering made by fire. For a sweet savior, all the fat is the Lord's. Now God required, his requirement was that when you offer sacrifice, be sure to make it smoke. Everywhere in the Bible talks about burning something on the altar. The Jewish Bible translates it as make it smoke. And by the way, that's my subject this morning. Make it smoke. That's the title of the sermon. And the applications are obvious. Whatever you offer to God, whatever it is that you offer to God, be sure to make it smoke. In other words, give it everything you got. God is not looking for half-hearted Christians to go through life with no enthusiasm. Have you ever seen people that just don't have nothing? Well, you know, I've been baptized in Jesus' name. You know, I go to church and you know, I'm, I'm a Christian. Where's your enthusiasm? What happens to when I think about the goodness of Jesus and all that he has done for me? What happens to that? What happens when you remember the day that you got the Holy Ghost? What happened to that? What happened to the day that you remember that you prayed and God answered your prayer and you knew, didn't nobody know that you needed it but God? He is looking for those who have sold out to his cause. He is looking for someone who will live for him with a passion. Paul said in Romans 12 and 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. We are not offering bulls and goats and lambs and turtle doves. What we're offering to God today is ourselves. Ourselves. But just as God required that the priests make the fat to smoke, he requires us to serve him with our whole heart. In the book of Mark, Jesus said, Jesus answering him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, 
the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. Let me say that again. With all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. So everything that we are and everything that we have, God requires us to serve him with that. We have to make it smoke. Salvation without passion is a sacrifice without smoke. How important was it for the sacrifice to be made to smoke? Eli, the high priest, had two sons. Now listen, these two men, the Bible said, were base. In other words, these two men, they had no relationship with God. Now they were Eli's sons, but they had no relationship with God. Now what the Lord wanted them to do is when the people would bring their sacrifice, then the priest would send his servant to serve them. And then they would put the sacrifice on the altar and they would burn the fat. And then the meat that remained, either the priest would eat it or the one who brought the sacrifice, they would take it back and they would eat it. The Lord didn't require that. He wanted the fat. He wanted that part that caused the fire to go up. Now these men that had no relationship with God, and they wanted all of the meat that they could get. Now they were already set up in the law you get this amount but they wanted more you ever seen greedy folks today the lord bless them with a thousand dollars they want two he bless them with two they want five he bless them with five they want ten and they never give anything back because they always say you know what i can't afford to give i can't afford to give it back If you can't afford to give it back, then you can't afford to have it. So what they did, the men would get ready to put the sacrifice on the altar. And his sons said, well, just warm it up and don't let it, don't let the fat cook off. So what in essence they were saying is that the part that belonged to God we want that too. It's a dangerous thing to take God's part for yourself. He calls you a wicked servant when you take his part. And you're never blessed. You can have a hundred times a hundred, but if you take what belongs to God, you still will not be blessed. He put holes in your pocket. He'll cause things to break down. He'll cause things to enter your budget that wasn't in the budget. All because you didn't give him what belongs to him. So what they did, they didn't treat the people fairly. They wanted, but they didn't want to give it to God. So they offered the sacrifice, but they refused to let the fat smoke. And I will say it again, salvation without passion is a sacrifice without smoke. It looks good, it goes through the motions, but it lacks what God is looking for. Paul described it in 2 Timothy like this, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. You ever seen people go through the motion, they have the rhetoric, praise the Lord, how you doing? I'm blessed and highly favored. But you ask them, what does that mean? They don't know. Yes, we're blessed and highly favored because we're in God. We're in Christ. All of us that's in him are blessed and highly favored. That's why we can have what we say because we're in him. It's not us doing the work, it's him. Just like Jesus, whatever he said came to pass. But Jesus said, it's not me that do the work, but my father. 
There's another interesting aspect of the sacrifice. Most of the sacrifices were offered, were also eaten by either the priests or those who brought the offering. God did not require the whole animal. He just wanted the fat. And the rest of the meat was cooked and enjoyed by those who offered the sacrifice. So what are you saying? I'm using tithe because that's something we can all identify with. But there's more sacrifices than just tithe. There's a, there's a time. How much time do you give unto the Lord? How much time do you give him? What sacrifice do you make for him? And this can be as simple as prayer in your home. How much time do you spend with him? Well, I don't spend much time with him because I got to get my rest. Have you ever thought about if the Lord didn't wake you up, you couldn't wake up? We don't wake up on our own. We don't do anything on our own. It's all because of God's grace and his mercy that we're not consumed. So how much time do we actually spend with God? Leviticus 7 and 8 says, And the priest that offered any man's burnt offering, even the priest shall have to himself the skin of the burnt offering which he had offered, and all the meat offering that is baked in the oven. So the priest had a part. Sometime we don't want the priest to have anything. Well, this is the sacrifice that they make. They might not have as much as you, but they are entitled to at least eat. <laughs> now, why? Why are they entitled to eat? Well, because they didn't have an inheritance. The Lord didn't give them any part of the land. What he gave them was a responsibility to work in the temple. And then when the people would bring their offering, their sacrifices, then the priests received part of that. And when they wouldn't do it. Because there were times that they got mad. Said, we ain't bringing no sacrifice. You know what happened? The fruit on the trees dried up. The herds died. Because they didn't do what they were supposed to do. But the minute they start doing it again, everything prospered. Well, if you want to prosper, you have to do it God's way. You have to do it and not do it begrudgingly, but do it with joy. You have to make it smoke. I'm glad I have to give. I'm glad I can invest in God's plan. You know, I heard on the news uh, how uh, our president is defunding some of the watch agencies that watch over the air, make sure the air is clean, make sure the water is clean. He's defunding some of those things. And so they were protesting yesterday, and he said this morning that uh, he's all for it. He's all for clean water. He's all for clean air as long as it don't take jobs away. Well, if you pollute the air, then you have to find a way to get the job done without polluting the air. Because you know what? A lot of us don't have as many days ahead of us as we have behind us, but we have children. What kind of air will they be breathing? We have our children's children. What kind of water will they be drinking? So what we have to do, God will bless us. He will strengthen us. We can get jobs and we can get better jobs. We can get all of that as long as we do it his way. As long as we do it his way. I was talking to uh, a saint the other day and she called me to tell me that she had got promoted. And um, I said, well, praise the Lord, I'm so happy for you. And uh, she said, Bishop, uh, I got promoted and uh, I got a significant raise. 
And I said, well, praise the Lord. And what you going to do for God? See how the Lord blesses us? And when he blesses us, we don't all the time want to bless him. But we have to bless him. That's our sacrifice. I heard one bishop say uh, a couple months ago, he said, you know what? The Lord has blessed some to begin their tithing at 10%, not stay at 10%. He said to some it would be an insult to just give 10% because how the Lord has blessed you. For where much is given, much is required. He expects us to go beyond just the regular because he's blessed us beyond just the regular. All right, all right, I'm going to behave. The sons of Eli, they refuse to wait for the fat to smoke before enjoying the blessings. Some serve God only for the blessings, but they take him, they never take the time to make a smoke. They just want him because, you know, I can have all things in Christ to strengthen me. I know the Lord answers my prayer. So I, I'm serving for that. I serve him to use his credit card. I use it by faith. I serve him because I can. he gives me a blank check and he signs it, and all I have to do is fill it in. By faith, I receive. So I serve the Lord for that reason. But I don't necessarily want him. It might be like that man that loved you or that woman that loved you. And they just hand you their credit card. And you go out, and you get a new dress, or you get a new suit. But it's not because you love them that you're using it because it's just because they gave it to you. There are some blessings that we will receive. It don't matter. We're going to receive it. If we go outside and the sun is shining, it's going to shine on you just like it shine on everybody else. It's just part of the blessing. So you hold your hand up and say, Lord, thank you for the sunshine. But what are you doing for God? Are you really enthused about the sunshine and how God has blessed you? Or are we just going through the motion? We have an expectation of the Lord. But we have to also remember that all of our expectation, he don't have to do none of them. Make it smoke. A passion to speak. You ever notice how difficult it is to sell something that you don't like. A person who is passionate about a product is the best salesman. You ever seen people try to get you to do something that they ain't enthused about themselves? Try to eat, get you to eat broccoli and they don't like it themselves. Go ahead and it, it's good for you. Well, do you eat it? How excited are you about the Lord? Or oh, you need to get your life in order. You need to uh, come to church and, and, and begin to give God some praise and worship him. And, and watch God move in your life. But what about you? Every time I talk to you, you're complaining about this and that. And not only are you complaining, but you're talking about the folks in the church. So even if I was going to give my life, I ain't going to where you're going. Those who are sold out to this cause have no difficulty selling it. Psalms 39 says, I will take heed to my ways, that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle. While the wicked is before me, I was dumb with silence. I held my peace even from good and my sorrow was stirred. My heart was hot within me while I was musing the fire burn and I spat with my tongue. We find here that Jeremiah, this Jeremiah, this boy that God called from his mother's womb, that because he would prophesy with fire and fervent, that the people did not like him. And he became very discouraged. Because the people refused to hear him. And the people refused to hear God's call. 
So they put him in the stocks that were on a high gate of Benjamin, which was by the house of the Lord. Then, Jeremiah said, then I said, I will not make mention of him. Because the people didn't want to hear and they wanted to kill him. He said, I'm not going to make mention of him. Nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing and I could not stay. What are you saying? He said that, you know what, even though I said, even though I was discouraged, and even though I said, I'm not going to say anything concerning the Lord, I'm not going to do anything, but when I settled myself, his word was like fire shut up in my bones that I couldn't help myself. I still had to give him praise. I still had to tell what thus said the Lord. I still had to do it. If you ever call on your life, you got to do it. You got to do it. You got to do it. You must do it. You can't help but do it. So we find that, like David, Jeremiah felt something burning inside. He wasn't content with a half-cooked sacrifice. He decided to make it smoke. We live in a wicked and perverse generation. It's time someone felt the fire of the Holy Ghost burning in their heart and boldly proclaiming the truth to this world. It is time to make it smoke, whether on our jobs, in our classrooms, or at the restaurant, or at the church. Jesus said, whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. You be ashamed of me now, I'm going to be ashamed of you later. Christians in hiding. We don't want nobody to know. Have you ever uh, worked on a job and after five years of working with a person, you, you find out that they say they say. There should be some things that's established from the beginning. I'm saved and sanctified. I want you to know that. I never tell anyone uh, necessarily who I am. I try to let my life do the speaking. So while they're cursing and acting a fool, I am just keep on doing my work. I don't have to get in every conversation. I don't have to laugh at the jokes. Well, you know, some of them are funny, and you're absolutely right, but when you see them coming, then turn around and do something else. You don't have to laugh at them. You don't have to be a part of them because you're representing the kingdom of God. The reason that the company is doing good is because you're there. Do you not know that sometime God will close the company if it wasn't for you? Your neighborhood will be jacked up, but it's not because of you. And we don't want to make it smoke. We don't want to praise him. We don't want to give him the kind of praise. We don't want to do that. We just want to sit back and lean back and be comfortable. But God is saying, no, no, no. I need somebody that's going to do something. The world is full of individuals who can talk a good line, but never act. They talk good, but they don't do it. The best coach seem to be the ones who have never coached. Call it Monday coaching. The best politicians seem to be the one who had never run for office. If it was me, I would do this and that. Have you ever noticed that politicians, when they're running for office, they have all of these uh, grandeur uh, statements they got to make and dreams and things that they're going to do. But when they get the facts, I see, they don't know everything. They're just looking from the outside. But when they get on the inside and get the facts, things have a habit of remaining the same. They might tweak it a little bit. Except the president we have now, we don't know what he's going to do. We have to really pray for him. 
But I found out even with praying that he's not the one in control. The one that's in control, his name is Jesus, not Trump. The one that really sits on the throne is not Trump, it's Jesus. And he's not only concerned about the United States, he's concerned about Europe, he's concerned about Asia, Africa, he's concerned about the whole world. For he is the Lord of the world. The best investors seem to be the ones who have never invested. Could it be that the ones who seem to be the best Christians have never actually done anything for God? They just talk the talk. David went to see the mighty army of Israel. No doubt he had heard of their great exploits of Saul and his army. Being an Israelite, he would have heard the great victories through Gideon and Samson and Joshua and others. He understood that nothing could defeat the mighty army of Jehovah. Yet when he approached the battlefield, there was a champion of the camp of the Philistines. And this champion was talking about, send me a man that we might fight. And the whole armies of the Lord was at bay over one man. And David, he got up there and he started looking and he, he was just surprised that nobody was fighting these Philistines. They were all scared. Have you ever been scared to lay hands because the devil tell you that if you lay hands on them, you're going to get what they got? Or he'll tell you if you lay hands and pray, God is not going to answer your prayer anyway. But let me tell you this. If I do it in faith, believing that I receive what I ask God for, I'm not worried. Because I'm not asking myself to do it because I'm in him. And so what I do is through him, God does it. Let me see this little boy. We see this little boy. He inquired. First thing he wanted to know was, well, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that will define the army of the living God? And his name is Goliath. But then his next question was, well, uh, what is the king going to give uh, to the man that defeated him? And he said, well, he's going to give him the hand of his daughter. He's going to be a member of the royal family. So David, from that point on, he never called him by his name. He was always uncircumcised. Circumcision means that you had a covenant. So here was this man, this, this, this giant that had no covering, that had no covenant with God. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that would dare defile the army of the living God? So he went to the king and he said, I'll fight him. I'll do it. But he was a boy. All of the men are at bay scared. But this boy, this boy said, I'll do it. So the king wanted to know, well, what makes you think you qualified? If everybody else scared, how come you're not scared? He said, let me tell you something, King. While I was watching my father's sheep, a lion came. And I slew the lion. And a bear came. And I slew the bear. And the same God that gave me the strength to slew the lion and the bear is going to give me the ability to take down this Philistine, this uncircumcised. I can't get over the fact that he has no circumcision. He has no covenant with God, and he's going to come up. Let me tell you something. Every time the devil come up, you ought to say, you know, you have no covenant with God, and I'm in covenant with the Most High. I have authority over you. We have to make it smoke. We have to make it smoke. We have to be excited. You know, when new saints, I, I love new saints when they, when they first get the Holy Ghost. Because these mother, you know what they do? They go lay hands on the sick. They don't even think about nothing but the sick getting healed. The fact that they might not get healed don't even enter their mind. 
And that's what we should be. It shouldn't even enter our mind that God is not going to heal and God is not going to deliver and God is not going to hear because all of those things, we believe that he will hear. He will deliver because I am in covenant with him. And he said, listen to this. He sent his only begotten son to come down and to tell us whatsoever you ask the father in my name. You know what, if he said nothing else, if he didn't say anything else, and he said, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will do it. See you later. <laughs> so he tried to put on the king's armor. But how many know you can't wear everybody's armor? You can't wear everybody's praise. You can't wear everybody's worship. You have to have your own. So he didn't put on nothing. He, 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 didn't, he didn't have no armor to put on. He wasn't, see, you know what? He wasn't worried about this uncircumcised Philistine. So he stopped on his way out into the field by the brook and got him five smooth stones. And his slingshot. So he steps past the sergeant, the lieutenant, past the captain, past the general. And he's out here on the battlefield. And this uncircumcised Philistine is insulted. You better beware who you fighting. You can't look at size. You can't look at gender. You can't look at none of that. He didn't take him seriously. So what he said is, you, you send a boy out here to fight me? When I get through with him, I'm coming over and get you. All of y'all. So David said, you know, you come against me with the sword and the shield. But I come against you in the name of the Lord. He started winding up. Failure didn't enter his mind. Church, failure shouldn't enter our mind. Because we're making the smoke. See, nobody told him he had to do it, but it was the zeal of the Lord that was in him that caused him to step past everybody else. And he slung, and when he let go of that rock, not only did it hit him in the head, it enlarged itself in his head. He was brain dead. He was dead and didn't know he was dead. David just walked up to him, got his own sword, cut his head off. Took his head to the king. Here you go, king. Later on, he understood that it was a mistake taking the king's daughter. <laughs> Because she didn't have the same relationship with God that he had. Let me tell y'all something. You better be careful who you join yourself with if they don't have the same relationship with the Lord that you had. Make it smoke. So we see that God answered the prayer. Israel was delivered. God showed himself strong on their behalf. I'm reminded of another man. His name was Asa. And that's our text. Asa was the king. He became king at a very early age because his father died. And he surrounded himself with wise men. And he built cities and he put fence around the city. And he had a great army. He had two or three hundred thousand people in his army he had men of valor he had chariots he had a, a bow and arrows he had a great army but the Ethiopians rose up against him and they had 1,000 they had 100,000 times 100,000 
That's what the Bible said, 100,000, 100,000. They had some folk. And they came up against Asa. Asa, he wasn't moved. He said, Lord, you're able to do this. But he was saying, Lord, I need you to make it smoke. <laughs> you're able to do this. So he said, whether it's a lot, whether they're great, it don't matter. For we rest in you. Rested in you. What he was saying is that our confidence is in you. It's not in our own ability, but we know if you do it, it's done. And if you don't do it, it can't be done. And when he said that, the Lord turned against the Ethiopians. Even though they were greater in number, they began to flee from Asa's army. And they began to pursue them. You know, that smoke will make you pursue. Not just defeat, but pursue. It will make you go after your blessing. The Bible said that they overcame the Ethiopians and great was the spoil. But he's saying that all the stuff that they had, all of the gold, all the silver, all their weaponry, they took it all. That's what God will do. The spoils go to the victor. Our president, he tried to say that uh, the oil that was in Iraq, uh, we should have grabbed a hold of it. But if you're coming to liberate somebody, then you don't take what they have. <laughs> Our fight wasn't against the, against the Iraq people. And they didn't say the right things anyway. I, you know, I know I'm not supposed to be talking about politics, but, you know, this is not politics. This is history. Because what they said, they said that they had uh, weaponry that could destroy their neighbors, but they didn't have nothing. They, they, didn't, they didn't have nothing. But here we find that the prayers. So, so what's, what's the purpose of all that I'm saying? Is that the fact that we should be putting on the altar is our prayers. Is our prayers. The fact that we should be putting on the altar is praising God for answering our prayers. If you don't believe that God will answer prayer, why pray? If you don't, if you don't believe that God hear you when you pray, then why pray? This man cried and the Lord heard him and delivered him from all of his fears. He had fear. He had, he had fear because he had troubles. And the Lord delivered him. I'm almost finished, but let me declare the glory of God. You know what? We should be declaring the glory of God amongst the heathens. His wonders amongst all people. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Oh, let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. Make it smoke. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable. One generation declared unto another. Who have you told of his goodness? What we tell our children so many times, get you a good job. Get you a good education, get you a good job. And you don't have to ask nobody for nothing. But except the Lord build a house. <laughs> they that labor, labor in vain. Except the Lord do it. And except we recognize that it's him doing it.
and give him praise. You know, while we're in waiting, we still ought to be giving him praise because we have an expectation of what God is going to do. It's not if he blesses me, it's when. Oh, glory. It's not an if, it's a when. Because God is going to do what he said he's going to do. If his word said it, he'll do it. Mother, I'm going to move this a little bit away from you. Because I'm told that it, it, it gives out a little heat. Okay, and you're not cold, are you? Okay, well then I'll put it about right here. I moved it to Sister Judy. I put it over here close to Sister Jane. And she all right. You need smoke? Okay. Okay, go make it smoke. Now what are you doing? What is this? These are the prayer requests of the saints. Come on, Charles. These are the prayer requests. These are, Lord, bless my children. Lord, bless my situation that I'm in. Turn it around. We lay it upon the altar of God. We put it in the prayer box. So I, I, I take it and I put it in here because I don't read them. And I want to show you that I don't read them. But I waited just a little long. And it was, it was I say the saints are going through because this prayer thing is full. I don't think we could got another piece of paper in there. But I'm here to declare and de declare today, and I decree before the Lord that every need is met according to the purpose in which you ask God to do. But I just wondered about one thing. I, I know that these are requests, but I just wondered if there was one in there that wasn't a request, that maybe somebody said, I have need of nothing, I just want to give you a praise and put it in the prayer box. I don't, I, don't, I don't want nothing. I don't want anything. I just, want, I just come to give you praise. So when we write out this request, it's praise the Lord. The first should be the last. The last should be the first. So, uh, Charles, here's the, here's the top. It's going to be a little smoky. Oh, I'm still getting requests. Didn't I just tell y'all this thing was full? I'm almost scared to light it. But I'm not going to close the door. I just want to give God praise. Why? See, if you put it in here and you believe that God is an answer of a prayer, then we ought to be up on our feet. We ought to be giving God praise for our answered prayer. Make it smoke. Make it smoke. That's the way we should be. It should be like fire shut up in our bones. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he has done for me, that's the way it should be. I should be on fire for the Lord. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise thy works to another and shall declare thy mighty acts. I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty and of thy wondrous works. And men shall speak of the might and thy terrible acts. And I will declare thy greatness. I shall abundantly utter the memory of thy great, of the great goodness and shall sing of thy righteousness. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all and his tender mercies are all over his works. 
all thy works shall praise thee, O God. And thy saints shall bless thee. They shall speak of thy glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and his wondrous majesty of his kingdom. Get excited about what God has done. Talk about his greatness. Tell how he saved you. Make it smoke. 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 Now I can only talk about myself in this case. But when I tell somebody how the Lord saved me, I get so excited I can't hardly stand. You know how sometimes tragedy happens in our lives and when we start talking about it, we go right back to when it happened. It seemed like it happened yesterday. Anybody ever been there? It's a traumatic thing. But when we talk about it, it takes us right back. But when I talk about receiving the Holy Ghost, it takes me right back. July 13, 1973. Takes me right back. One o'clock in the afternoon at the altar with the mothers that was wearing white and their heads tied up in white. And they were saying, call on Jesus. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Call on Jesus. Call him Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And I remember, I remember, I remember calling on his name. I remember when my language changed. And it wasn't because of me. It wasn't that a language that somebody taught me. It wasn't something that I heard. It was coming from down on the inside. And you know what? I felt like there was a whirlwind happening on the inside of me. And it was going up and up and up and up. And when it hit my tongue, I began to speak. And I tried to stop, but I couldn't stop. I covered my mouth to see if I could stop, but I couldn't stop. I experienced something I had never experienced before. I experienced God in me. Now here, at the same time God entered me, I entered him. <laughs> For if my word abide in you and you abide in me. For in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the word was made flesh. So when the Holy Ghost entered me, I entered God. At that moment, we became one. I became one with God and he became one with me. Now I still had work to do, but I was still in him. And just because I might have messed up, he didn't boot me out. So today, 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 we got to get a fire for the Lord. We got to get that excitement back. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to tell you to get it back. I don't. I can tell you, and you sit there and look at me. Say, well, we got excitement. But I wonder what would happen, Sister Judy, if I came up and I offered uh, a check for a thousand dollars, a good check. That you can go to any, well, not even a check, a cashier's check. Cashier's check for a thousand dollars. Say, you know what, I'm giving you this not because you deserve it, but because I just want to. Do you think I'll get a different reaction? You think I'll get somebody's hand to go up and say, thank you, Jesus? Do, I, do you think I'll get anybody to stand up and at least smile and say, hallelujah? Do you think I'll get any kind of reaction? Well, God is worth more than $1,000. His benefits are worth more than $1,000.
So we have to praise him for ourselves. I praise him for his goodness toward me. I, I do. I praise him for his goodness toward me. Every morning I say, Lord, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for waking me up. Because you know what? I realized I could have died in my sleep. I realized you could have got a call that said he's unresponsive. But praise the Lord, I'm yet here with the ability to give him another praise. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And they that uh, dwell upon the earth, they all belong. We all belong to God. I'm going to praise him with fire. With fire. So some says, why? Being a small church, did we put on so many things? All I know is church, church, church. But I say unto you, because I'm making it smoke. 